180 top editors across 240 brands. 22% are only women. You're one of the few, you know, you who, who are at that role and position. What do you see around you? Self-censoring is a big danger that social media harassment puts journalists through. The second, of course, is that it is really, uh, it really impacts people's health, physical, mental, etc. We are seeing a lot of journalists self-censoring and I think that is horrendous. So, individual journalists are really going through a lot of trouble all across the country. So, this has become a worry and it's adding to our already stressful job. This is a time when you want to speak out, right? There's no point asking tough questions when it's an easy time. We're looking at a profession very close to my heart. We're looking at media, we're looking at journalism, we're looking at women in media, and we're looking at leadership roles and also the rights of journalists, given that so much is going on around them. So stay with me, you're on Table Talk. And uh, a quick reminder Jotsna Mohan on YouTube to subscribe, to share, to like, and uh, lots of episodes uh, will keep coming on that show. But, I'm looking today to speak with Dhanya Rajendran. She is the editor-in-chief of the News Minute and she joins me from Bangalore today to speak about covering media, being a leader. Very, very few people who are in that leadership position when it comes to the media. Thanks for doing this. So I'll quickly dive in and let you go in a bit. And, uh, you know, I'm looking to, there's a recent report that's actually come out, Oxford uh, Reuters report, which has looked at leadership uh, you know the percentage of leadership roles for women 22 percent i think uh, 180 top editors across 240 brands 22 percent are only women uh you know that that's the level that's actually breaking the ceiling you're one of the few you know you who, who are at that role and position what do you see around you when it comes to uh, women at that role? So, one thing i want to say is that i am a woman editor because i started my own organization now, if I had worked for a legacy media organization or any media organization, I don't know if I would have ever become editor, right? Because I have to pass through so many uh, uh, stacks of people. Uh, therefore, I, uh, whenever people tell me that you are one of those women, few women, women editors in India, uh, it's only because I started a media house. I don't think there was any other possibility. Also, because I am not placed uh, in a. I, I live in Bengaluru far away from Delhi or Bombay where most newsrooms are uh, based out of in India. If you look at any like media organization, especially television, which I was a part of, they are all from Delhi or Bombay. So there was no way that I could have become an editor. So I think in India also, if you take statistics, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of women who are editors actually have started their own organizations. The only reason why we have uh, more uh, number of women uh, now, like I know that media, uh, News Laundry and Oxfam does this uh, research every year. But my strong feeling is that the numbers have gone up a little bit in India only because a lot of women have started their own ventures. Whether it's Padma Priya in Hyderabad with Suno India, whether it's Vanila Mohan in uh, Kerala with True Copy Thing, uh, She the People. There are so many feminism in India all started by women. Therefore, they're editors of their own organization. Coming back to the News Minute, and it's been a few years since you launched it, but uh... Tell me, what was it that really motivated you to dive into it? You know, it, it's it's your own business, it's your own startup, and it's not easy. So, what motivated me? Is, um, I was working for Times Now. I worked there for eight years. So you can imagine how what a joyful journey it was. Uh, it was not bad in the the first six years. I did quite enjoy. Uh, I mean, not that I look uh, I look back and I'm proud of all the work I did. I'm not. But what I am proud of most of the work and I did have a good time. But I think after six or seven years, I realized that I'm not just a journalist, but I'm also a marketing agent. For example, if a mango falls from a tree in Bombay, that's very important. If an entire mango tree falls in Kerala or Karnataka, nobody cares. Uh, I'm just making a very simple comparison because, you know, when newsrooms are based out of Delhi or, or Bombay, they only care about what is happening there. So I felt like I'm not just a reporter, I'm a marketing agent who has to continuously market a story from from here saying that, hey, this is important, why are we not playing it up? And I felt, um, I felt uh, really, 
vexed with that and of course by that time it was 2013 when i realized that i can't do tv news anymore because we were becoming too opinionated uh, there were specific stories which actually drew me out of tv and i did not have any job 2013 i quit i had a, i my son was 2 years old uh in within 2 months people are messaging me saying what is your next job have you thought about it? because i had got a huge promotion in times now from a reporter in a bureau i was suddenly made south bureau chief and then i quit within 2 years so i realized in india you cannot be jobless if you have had a career and you want to take a break people either think that that's it uh, it's because nobody wants to give you a job or because i don't know or all sorts of assumptions and every day i'll be bombarded with where are you joining next where are you joining next so i felt pressure to actually do a job and i went for a television interview when i went for a television interview it really gave me like uh, it made me panicky that i had to go back to tv again and i thought what is the option in life i mean how will i shut up people who are continuously asking me what is your next job and also have a job which doesn't drive me crazy uh, which is when i thought let's be start something on my own uh at that time the journalist chitra subramanian who did the bofo story she was also in india and she was also looking to come back to media so therefore i joined with her and my husband vignesh and we started the news fantastic you know actually it's interesting that and i was going to ask you this later but you already brought this up the fact that you know you were like a marketing agent trying to market a story and i've seen that you know because i'm also from i'm not really from delhi i'm from punjab and my you know my family is a or all journalists so the fact that a you have to continuously try and market a story to delhi or bombay and b i do you also feel like sometimes these centers don't have a grasp on what the real story is 100% for example uh, when i was reporting out of bangalore for uh, for for the for the english channels most of the time we would report uh, saying that i'm just giving you a small example yeah. most of the would report uh, you know the metro not the dhamma metro in bangalore where there will be english yeah. signs uh the kannada activists would come in black and it saying that why why is there not uh, why is there no kannada right uh they would black and it when it is only hindi and english so at that time for a national channel i re- i i used to report it saying that uh you know uh, pro kannada groups are again at it pro kannada groups violence uh, against the language etc but my perspective changed later i understood that you know the agitations are not against the language it is not against english or hindi it is against the uh, op- imposition of a certain language at the cost of another right so that perspective change for me i mean there are so many stories like that i can uh, on a day, i don't watch tv now i don't actually we don't have cable in our house therefore i don't know what tv does anymore uh, uh, but i'm pretty sure that when it comes to how to report a story from a particular area and this is despite their reporters knowing clearly the reporters know very clearly how what is happening but they are they are like stuck in a system which does not allow them to put th- forward things in a certain perspective so that way you know even if you report things are lost in transit i feel like by the time the story comes on air it's not even like how you report it when i was reporting out of chennai and bengaluru for television news jay jayaratha and karunanidhi were there uh, so they were important people as far as tv was concerned tv was concerned therefore tamil nadu will get will get more coverage there was literally no political leader from kerala who uh, the english news channels wanted to cover sometimes ak anthony here or there because sonia gandhi uh, related issues but other than that there was nobody they were interested in i mean anything can happen to any of the leaders they were not interested karnataka before bs yadurappa uh, then bs yadurappa came there was no coverage but the moment the mining scam started that's when the interest got, got, went up on bs yadurappa and even then you know the it's all very personality driven like who is the personality that you want to report on which is the politician that you want to speak on and then there's absolutely no perspective as to what is happening so how do you cope with it is you know the the whole agenda of fake news and how do you kind of keep your, your employees you know in the system to understand a the difference between really what is right and what is fake no so the first thing i'm doing now is to tell people who work with me that the we have to be more categorical about the words we use right which is misinformation and disinformation i mean i keep saying this everywhere now because i i mean this last few months i've started doing this considering that the government passed uh, brought in the digital media rules saying that there's a lot of fake news doing the rounds there is, there's a lot of fake news against women and children so i believe that first we have to be very careful about words we use so i tell my colleagues at first we have to figure out what is misinformation and what is disinformation for example today there was a uh, uh, 
there were these last week there were these stories about uh, migrant laborers in tamil nadu how videos were doing around saying that the migrant laborers were being attacked in tamil nadu that is disinformation which is someone is spreading news with the intent of creating trouble misinformation is just reporting stories wrongly so first as journalists we have to differentiate these two phenomenons and i think one big problem that we face is speed speed actually brings down our quality quite a bit uh, we had put out a new story two three days ago which i think was done in a hurry and the editing was a shoddy process and the story was wrong. i mean i disagree with the story that we ourselves did i think it did not meet our own editorial standard because speed sometimes does that to us so you know we have to time and again remind our, our newsroom that you know speed is not what matters the most uh, it is consistency it is credibility so these are things that young journalists have to be told uh, we we were taught the wrong things we were t- told that do it fast uh, put it out fast uh, you know report the news but i think now uh, reporters have to be told that people watching the news reading the news they have so many sources they don't care where they get it from they care as to what is the extra information the news organization is giving how credible is their information tv we were told we have you, you know quickly bring it out bring it out i get that but now when everything is online it's it's even worse isn't it you know the whole fastest finger first syndrome kind of a thing ki upload karna hai dalo 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 i mean you've got to just put it out how do you you know then restrain a generation that is young that is really you know that is brought up on the whole mantra of everything is instant but sometimes i think that this instant business is something that journalists are bothered about but not rest of society for example if something happens like let's say a building falls okay that is something you have to put out immediately right so there are so many things we can wait 20 minutes 30 minutes and put out but people don't uh, i think it's amongst journalists that there is this there is this rush to put out news i don't think that's the same for the public they don't mind getting the news 20 minutes later 30 minutes later but if it is worth reading this information i have a i have a chart which i have pasted in my news room like not a chart like a, a three line so i we tell our colleagues that when you read a story could the story have been written by someone sitting out of kashmir is my first question which means uh, for example uh, if uh, not not a god yours someone sitting in kashmir who does not know telugu or telugu cinema can also write not not a one day oscar anybody can write that sitting in south india how are we adding any value to that story right what extra information are we bringing to a normal news story now the second question i write is when someone living in chennai bangalore hyderabad etc read the story what is the extra input that they are getting that's first thing the third person i ask them is what if someone is staying in madurai uh, or mysore etc reading this what is the extra information they get so each layer is supposed to tell the reporter that your story has to be appealing to a person in delhi where all the big ba- the basics are there but for someone reading from bangalore there has to be more detail for someone let let's say it's a bangalore story which a mysore person is reading and you are talking about an area like mg road and you just say bangalore is mg road you have to tell mg road is is the most commercial area of bangalore it's the heart of bangalore right those kind of things so i think it's all about what are our priorities who are our audience who are we speaking to who are we speaking for is it is it a trying time in in the profession you know the i mean at least we've seen it with tv news it's kind of uh, on on i mean i don't really know how much to trust it anymore right so uh, what about you know online media it's a very trying time i mean i don't even know how to explain this when i was a reporter sometimes i feel like danya why did you do this you should have just worked for someone else you know there's no headache just get your salary every month do reporting every day there's absolutely no problem in life right now i have to ensure that when i read a story who's going to give a case what kind of case will it be how can i you know ins- uh, insulate my reporter my organization from that then there are a lot of other issues for example we had income tax uh, cases going on for almost 3 years and it was finally shut because the income tax department couldn't find anything but that doesn't mean that they can come back any time later uh, last 2 3 weeks there have been this really silly reports uh, saying that uh, um, we run a cartel called the digipub first thing digipub is not a cartel it's an association of digital media and this cartel wanted to bring adani down like they so powerful that they wanted to bring adani down and this is being reproduced by organizer the rss magazine now we know that no matter what rss of whoever puts out these are all base 
which is used by you know some IT and ED and whoever later. Therefore, there is a constant worry about who is going to target you for your news story, for running an organization, for being part of an association, for speaking out. So that worry is there constantly now, which never used to be there before. I mean, I'm not saying that our oh, story never used to worry us. Yes, the story used to worry us, but today, left and right people are giving cases. I mean, we are getting civil defamation, criminal defamation. Uh, there are other journalists with cases under UAPA, sedition, uh, all kinds of IP section. I was interviewing a journalist from Madhya Pradesh two, three days ago. He had reported about how COVID uh, pandemic is not being managed by the Madhya Pradesh government. Imagine they even put unrelated cases against him of attempt to murder and stuff like that. They had some five cases against him and he was in jail for six months just for doing his work. So people, uh, especially regional journalists, are really going through a lot of trouble all across the country. So this has become a worry and uh, it, it's adding to our already stressful job. How do you tell all these journalists out on the field what their rights are or does it even count where we are today? No, I mean, uh, it is actually very important that journalists are cognizant about their rights but it's also very important that journalists should know that so, some rights are not absolute in India and when some rights are not absolute you are going to be in trouble now that's one thing the other thing is the constant harassment from government from politicians from different groups corporates corporates in India are using litigation left and right to ensure that nobody speaks about them nobody writes about them uh, for, like Josie Joseph uh, uh, one of the most leading investigators in India. He has a case of rupees 2000 crore put by Jet Airways. Now, does Jet Airways think that at some point Josie Joseph, even if he loses the case, can give him 2000 crores? No, Jet Airways 100% knows that he cannot give it. The point of giving a case is that you intimidate. You are sending a message to other journalists to not write. So, corporates across India are using. So, therefore, not just one group anymore, it's almost everybody. And in Karnataka, one specific problem we face is this thing called ex parte injunction. Ex parte injunction, just to explain to people very simply, is I go to court and I say, Jyotsna will report on me tomorrow. I want a stay order on her. So without asking her version, without asking her what are you going to report on, the court will just give a stay order. It's called an ex parte injunction. Karnataka courts give ex parte injunction all the time. In fact, there was one particular thing where around 15 MLAs thought that their sexual acts have been caught by someone on camera and those CDs will be published. Around 15 of them got stay orders from courts saying that their sex CDs won't be published. I am not even interested in their sex CDs but uh, the blanket order comes from some 30 news organizations. Last week a BJP MLA got a, a, a injunction, a stay order saying that I think 46 media organizations should not report anything defamatory on him when 6 crore rupees was recovered from his house. How can the court give out such stay orders? So the problems are umpteen, like I can go on and on and on. But, uh, you know, other than telling young journalists what their rights are, I also tell them that this is the most exciting time to be a journalist. I mean, there's a lot of trouble. Uh, there is definitely a lot of worry. But it shouldn't stop anyone from being a journalist because this is a time when you want to speak out, right? There's no point asking tough questions when it's an easy when it's an easy time. The we should be asking tough questions when the when the atmosphere around us is challenging, and that makes the job all the more exciting. The whole aspect of speaking up and social media trolling that also kind of comes into the picture, doesn't it? I mean, it shuts a lot of people. Oh, very much. Social media uh, harassment uh, is it does a lot of things. First, is it, it makes a journalist self censor. For example, if I put out a story and there is extreme reaction to it, the next time I will think twice whether I want to do that story. Self-censoring is a big danger that social media harassment puts journalists through. The second, of course, is that it is really uh, it really impacts people's health, physical, mental, etc. People don't understand the kind of impact. Like for example, I used to have nightmares big time. I couldn't sleep. I used to be very panicky in the night. But now I'm okay. Like today, for example, there was one particular, I don't normally bother about tweet replies anymore because I feel like it's fine, like, you know, uh, people can say whatever they want and my work speaks for itself. But today I got triggered by a particular tweet. It's one Malayali BJP follower. I mean, not like BJP is the only party which does this crap on social media. A lot of people do, but they're just bigger in quantity, right? So in one of my videos, they have taken a particular, they have freeze, taken a freeze frame. Uh, in which I, 
and then they are using that picture to sort of uh, talk about sexual acts and continuously they have been doing for one week now so I just got triggered and I yelled at one of those guys so I'm saying though I believe that you know I can't be impacted by trolling though a lot of people think that oh Danya is always giving it back to her trolls yes but I am a human being too I mean at the end of the day what this does to me is that either I self-censor or I decide that what is the point I don't want to speak up about all this so I, I normally tell people working in my office that if there is something very controversial and people are trolling or harassing our handles I tell them not to check sometimes when I if I personally do a story with a uh, reporter, I don't tag them because I am a troll magnet and I don't want them to get harassed along with me. I disagree. Everybody can disagree. I have, but sometimes when I put out a story, around 500 people disagree with me. I'm fine with it. You, if it is my within my uh, freedom of expression, my freedom to report on something, it is well within their freedom to disagree with me. But the moment it crosses a line, where you know five. 100,000, 2,000 people come together to harass someone. Journalists are being impacted. We are seeing a lot of journalists self-censoring and I think that is horrendous. There's also family pressure, right, for a lot of people, for a lot of the yes. young people to stop speaking yes. up. In fact, in fact uh, I was speaking to a journalist, uh, uh, you know, two, three weeks ago who was getting harassed very, very badly, life threats, death threats, rape threats, all kinds of threats. Um, and, and her family is also feeling very, very unsafe what is happening. Uh, you know, and then that's when I suddenly realized that I've never had that problem where you know my father or my husband, whoever it is, they never feel um, I've never had this issue of convincing my family that look, it's fine, I can deal with it or maybe I've always ignored it, I mean they do feel unsafe but I've somehow, somehow uh, su uh, survived like that I, could, I didn't know what to tell her, she's a young journalist her mother and father are worried for her they may, she was telling me that you know they could even fix my marriage anytime. How? What do you tell young journalists like that? And what do you tell their families? In fact, sometimes one of my one of my colleagues who had quit uh, some time ago, she was telling me that this is a job that doesn't even pay very well compared to her peers who are in other industries. Plus, you are getting harassed online, offline, in government, non-government. What is your incentive? I mean, for the goodness of society, for the sake of democracy, there is only this much. A human being can do right you cannot go on and on and on is there you know like a mechanism in place for women journalists or is there a mechanism in place that is needed do you think in this environment? absolutely nothing and social media platforms are getting worse for example twitter now, now should be renamed as troller or something because twitter is now allowing free speech meaning it will allow any kinds of abuse like whatever it is so it is becoming more and more unsafe you cannot depend on any platforms I personally, like I said, I don't believe in uh, capping anybody's right of expression to actually disagree, dissent, etc. But only when it comes down to harassment, there has to be some way to deal with it. Uh, of course, you can, people can use mute, block, report, etc. But it's not helpful. It's not really helpful. You're going to help, you're heading down for elections. Is it going to get more challenging? Yeah. And uh, one election is, we have got two elections here, in fact. One is Karnataka and then there is Telangana. It is definitely going to get challenging because first thing, fake news. I think combating misinformation, disinformation is going to be a huge challenge this election because already here in Karnataka, for example, the BJP has made it clear that love jihad is going to be their focus, right? The BJP president has said, forget roads and infrastructure, let's talk about love jihad. So it is going to be challenging to look at misinformation and disinformation. Um, and the legacy media also is now simply you know they play out the speeches live and that's it there is absolutely no reporting on what is the content of the speech whether they're saying it correctly you know even the small things which are said during uh, campaign speeches which are wrong we are not doing fact checking we don't have enough resources for it i have three reporters a deccan herald would have 25 reporters even then it's not enough anymore i'm saying the volume of stuff which we we'll have to fact check during elections is really humongous now Changed quite a bit, hasn't it? The whole environment, the whole ecosystem. Yes. It's. What do you do? <laughs> you just just fight for it, you know, the way you can, I guess. And you know, in in the resources that you have, Danya. But uh, uh, what, what is you know, the final question, really? What is the most challenging part of your job? Is it misinformation? Cha no, I don't think so. For me, the most challenging part of the job is to continuously remind, like for example, we have these uh, four tires of stories. That Legal, right like feminism or whatever we have our own within our organization we have certain things that we believe in 
So just to constantly remind ourselves that look, you know, let's not let's not go away from these targets. These are things we have to constantly report on because it's very easy to stray away. It's very easy to get attracted by something else and then do that reporting. So I think for for me, the challenge is to constantly remind myself and everyone else that these are our core uh, values. This is what we should be reporting on as an organization. Uh, that's my biggest challenge. What's the percentage of women who uh, uh, apply for jobs versus men? So we have a pro- we have a peculiar problem. In fact, in the beginning, I used to think that oh, there's no gender discrimination. Uh, in in times now, I used to think I, there's no gender discrimination against me. When I started the news minute, I thought okay, now anyway, a lot of women are joining, and few men also sometimes send resumes. Later, I realized that most men who are senior never apply to the news minute. It's it's only changed very recently. We've got we have got. a senior male colleagues who have joined us but otherwise nobody used to apply to us perhaps they thought that the environment is too threatening for them is too threatening for them i don't know what but recently they had uh, more uh, men coming yeah thank you danya this is lovely thank you so much thank you